As writer Eddie Muller puts it, Ouija was born where commerce and art collide. I'll explain what I mean. In the 1930s, the press photography industry was mostly controlled by big newspapers that employed a handful of photographers that covered different subjects and events. However, there was also a high number of freelance individuals who sold their photos by piece and mostly struggled to make ends meet in a business that was highly competitive. And Ouija, a mostly self-thought photographer, would break into this world due to his savvy and aggressiveness, if you will, in terms of the methods he employed. Unlike like others, he was not in the business of photographing crimes to be seen as some sort of artist or to perhaps add credibility to this somewhat questionable trade. He was in it to make money. And the truth is that to distance himself and create a new ball game within the press photography field, the man surrounded himself with crime. In fact, he immersed himself in it. After years of working as a freelance photographer, selling his pictures to the ASME newspaper service for around 20 bucks, he became the first citizen in the United States of America to be allowed to carry a police radio in his car, which allowed him to get to the scenes of crimes incredibly fast. He carried everything he needed in terms of equipment in this car, and no, he didn't develop film in his car. That he used to do in his apartment. And he lived across a police station and over a gun shop, a location which he would take extreme advantage of by photographing criminals as they arrived to the police station and other social apparatus scenes. Most importantly, Ouija was fascinated with crime itself, particularly murder as a social phenomenon in itself. And he would not focus just on the experience of the police and the criminals, but also include the bystanders and other angles to the story or the event that was taking place. And this is what distances Widgey from his contemporaries, whilst other photographers focused on the victim and had a more documentarian approach, Widgey understood the importance of capturing the totality of the scene. And this video was made possible by Filmora. Filmora is a recurrent partner here on the channel and Filmora has just launched a new Halloween campaign. They released a new pack full of effects, transitions, titles and overlays related to this Halloween season. And Filmora has been a trusty editing software that a lot of people, including myself, have been using online, whether they're working on short or long form content. And these newly released effects are extremely easy to use. All you have to do is drag them to your timeline and adjust colors and sizes amongst many other options from directions, animations, etc. Which makes these highly customizable and definitely something that can turn your editing a more fun and engaging experience. And in case you need a little help, in the Filmora Community tab, you'll also find very useful tips and tutorials, not just for this pack, but for the whole software. So the link to Filmora is down below and you can benefit from using all the AI tools that they've also included in these last versions of Filmora. And my personal favorite is the AI image creation that I've used to create some fun images, as you can see right here on the screen. So Filmora is available in the link down below and I think you should give this spooky themed Halloween effect a try just for fun. And I would like to thank Filmora for kindly sponsoring today's video and now let's go back to it. 
meaning the victim, the police procedure, the bystanders. Therefore, each shot is an active take on storytelling and the dramatics of life and the social experience. And we can see this if we break some of his images down, because by breaking them, we quickly understand that much of their strength resides precisely on the storytelling nature of them and the details that add more and more layers to the picture, from people's expressions to other photographers on the scene. And adding to all of this is, of course, lines, perspective, mixed up with deep and strong contrasts created by the flash that he was using. And in my opinion, he understood that crime has a social experience is greater than just the victim and the perpetrator. There's the law, there's the bystander and the court of opinion. But talent and the understanding of a scene is not just how someone climbs to the top of the ladder of their profession. One can argue luck, of course, but there's also other qualities the man had that most definitely contributed to him taking over the profession. And in here, I want to talk to you about his total dedication to his business. He was ready at all times. And most of the times when we see an uncovered victim in his photographs, that is because he arrived there before the police ever did. And so this quickness and fast paced turnaround made him extremely successful with editors and within the press business. And since we're on the topic of talking about how one comes to dominate a certain trade, we can't forget an important aspect that is very often overlooked, personality. And Ouija had what many described as a larger than life personality, so much so that later in his life, he would be awarded the opportunity of being on TV and having small roles in movies and even working in Hollywood. In fact, in many of his correspondence, he expresses a great degree of self-belief, calling himself a genius and at times the famous Ouija, which curiously enough is how he signed his own pictures. And while I never knew the man personally, it seems to me from the information I had access to that Ouija is a character and the man behind this character added to the myth by behaving as this larger than life persona, which makes sense as we will later see in the video. So in a world of competitiveness, fast paced photography and glorification of appearances, Ouija understood the fundamental importance of growing a reputation and amassing influence as a photographer. He actually had a lot of important connections and he forged connections within the police, within, you know, politics. And that's how he became this sort of personality himself. But one important thing has to be said that whilst photographing New York, he was not photographing it from an outsider point of view. In fact, he was not just photographing the lives of others and the tragedies they succumbed to. Ouija grew up around the people that would later become his subjects. And this is super important because it is that back alley knowledge, that streetwise intelligence and capacity that made him also a figure that could navigate the different circles of society and of course, the murky waters of crime photography. So given this, both you and me can actually ask the question, who was Ouija? Ouija was born Asher Felig on June 12th, 1899 in the city of Zolochiv, part of modern day Ukraine. He arrived in the United States when he was only 11 years old and believe it or not, he would not start his professional photographic career until he was 36 years old. Up until then, he worked menial jobs and took many apprenticeships. And it was within this time that he adopted his pseudonym of Ouija. And while there's a lot of speculation and uncertainty as to how it happened, the most plausible theory was that when working as an apprentice in the photo department of the New York Times, his job was actually wiping away the excess water on the newsprints for which he was called the squeegee boy. But Ouija, being Ouija, went on to adapt squeegee to Ouija and claimed that it was based on the famous Ouija boards because, quote, he could divine magically where the crimes were going to happen. However, there is a practical side to this that I need to refer to you because it's super important when we put ourselves in the context of Ouija's era. By adopting Ouija, 
Felix in reality was hiding his ethnicity because if you were to work in the newspaper business back then, you didn't want to have a name that tied you to a particular community or culture. But this wasn't just, in my opinion, happening in the newspaper business, but generally speaking everywhere. People came to America in hopes of blending in and living the American dream. They came from very different backgrounds, but they all united when it came to searching for a new life, for a a better life and to kind of reinvent themselves. Funny enough, if we look at Hollywood, some of its greatest actors and directors were of different ethnicities and upon arriving to Hollywood, they adopted stage names and both the studios and press had an ongoing financial understanding that said people would be painted in the press according to the persona the studio's publicity department designated to them. Back then, the world wasn't as accepting as it is today, and still today we can argue that it isn't as accepting, but back then you wouldn't want to put yourself in a vulnerable position, socially speaking. But there's one thing that has to be said. Ouija wasn't just a crime photographer. In fact, his work spanned beyond this and whilst still retaining the same methods, shooting mostly at night with a flash on a 4x5 speed graphic or Greyflex cameras, he stretched his work reaching the fields of documentary and street photography. He photographed scenes that represented the greatest ecstasy of life, couples in love, a hot summer evening, and he is known by considering, quote, the greatest subject in the world to be life and death, being that the exact moment he wanted to capture. And the truth is that whether he photographed one of these two or both at the same time, he really had a knife for capturing a detail, a personality, and it's this storytelling quality associated with the refined organization of the frame itself that really gives his images a cinematic quality. So much so that his persona and images would later inspire a whole genre of films notorious for their hard-boiled characters and visually stunning contrasts of light and shadow. Of course, we're talking about film noir. And Ouija, of course, photographed a lot of the New York life, making a lot of images around Sammy's, which was a landmark Lower East Side venue where, as the New York Times puts it, at the time, drunks and swells, drifters and celebrities, the rich and the forgotten would meet. And if you remember from the video we made on Lizette Modell a long time ago, she was also a photographer that enjoyed photographing and did a lot of street photography around Sammy's. But anyways, it was precisely this idea of capturing and juxtaposing great wealth with dire poverty that really gives perspective over the world of this photographer, who to me is a somewhat of a genius given the way his photos can serve as a social commentary for the pathetic and much anticipated celebrity culture we now experience today, with images that capture how strange and at the same time fascinating it can be to watch people glorifying their peers. That being said, Ouija is also responsible, in my eyes, for creating a great number of photographs, particularly in the later years of his career, where he worked in LA and in Hollywood, in which he used prisms and other techniques to create distortions as a way to portray celebrities and famous people's faces, which in my eyes contributes to this idea of ridicule and a somewhat cynical vision of the world. In fact, it's a vision that, even though I can call cynical, it's a vision of someone who has seen a lot of the world and have seen different sides of the world and has a great knowledge of how the world works. In this sequence, it is important to recognize Ouija's role as the man who used a mask in order to unveil life's own odd circles, crude realities, and tragical comedy nature. And he did this by photographing in your face, by showing you the kinds of things you don't expect to see, and by also demystifying the things you are used to see, presenting you new perspectives and denying the boundaries and meanings of what we really are seeing or are used to see. So I can conclude by saying that whilst Ouija is a product of his own era, let's say the 1930s, 1940s, 50s, etc., and which also represents the golden age of film and, you know, uh, crime, art boy literature and etc., I think it's safe to say that he also, through his pictures, gives us glimpses of 
how society and how the world really works. And these things that he shows us still happen today. So there is this nature of his photos to become somewhat timeless. And this is why I believe that he should be named one of the biggest photographers of the 20th century and why he, in my opinion, changed the press photography game forever.